Hey, everyone. Uh, just changing up my view here. Hang on just a second. All right, so I think we've got everybody on that's going to get on. We may have a few stragglers, but uh, I want to welcome everybody to Pep Talk. We've got our guests lined up. Uh, certainly glad that all of you are here. A um, couple of things I want, before we uh, introduce the guests and get into the guests, there's a couple of things I do want to mention. And number one, hey, we're not giving medical advice, okay? Um, Dr. Tapson is going to be giving some, some excellent um, guidance on a lot of this stuff, including a lot of our questions, but he is not your doctor. Please remember that. If you have a medical issue, a medical question, um, and you hear something that you want to discuss with your doctor, that's great. Take it to your doctor. But just remember that we're not uh, giving up medical advice, so check with your medical provider. I'm going to give you a real brief overview of the MBCA real quick for those of you, and I know uh, through the group and the website, a lot of you are new to the National Blood Plot Alliance. So for those of you that are new, I want you to know the, that the MBCA is the leading advocacy organization in the U.S. for people who have had a blood clot or who are at risk for blood clots. We focus on increasing education and awareness about blood clot prevention, providing recovery resources like our website, stoptheclot.org, pep talk, um, all of that for patients who have been diagnosed and advancing the early treatment of BTE. Many of us are patients at the MBCA. We are survivors. We know blood clots. So this is all about maximizing as many lives saved as possible. And we do that through solid education, getting the word out there, and also being a support system. Look, if you are on our mailing list, if you are surfing around our website in our support group on stoptheclot.org on the Facebook page, if you're a part of that whole scene, then you are family. That's how we look at you. And that's how we're gonna treat you. Um, we're all in this together. And there's nothing more confusing in the medical world to me than blood clots. When it comes to clots, why they happen, recovery, all that, there's a lot of questions. So we all really need to stick together. I wanna to remind you that we are recording this. So just want you to be aware of that. So I, I've had a lot of messages today hoping that, that we were recording it because they can't watch it live. So this is going to be recorded. If you don't catch something and you go, oh, I, I didn't hear what they said, just know that you can go back and watch the show. We will post a link on stoptheclot.org and also in the Blood Clot Support Group for Team Stop the Clot. Um, the focus of tonight's pep talk is for men but I'm glad to see a lot of women on board. I know we've got some couples. This is really a refresher for everybody, although we are gonna be talking about a lot of uh, man topics when it comes to blood clots, because there hasn't been a whole lot of communication about that, and we need to get that information out there. Uh, so I'm glad that all of you showed up, no matter who you are. Also wanna give a shout out to Anari Medical, who is our sponsor, and they have sponsored our pep talks in the past, so we couldn't do it without those guys. Um, we're going to uh, put forth a real quick survey. It's going to pop up on your screen. Julia back at headquarters is going to make that. Could you guys please fill in where you heard about this pep talk, where you've been hearing about that? If, if you could just uh, do that so we can get an idea of um, where I guess I've got to do this too, where we uh, are, are uh, getting the word out there. Who are you hearing? Who are you hearing this from? Where are you at? Um, so what we're going to do is, uh, first, I'm just going to tell you who we've got, and then we're going to get into actual discussions with them. So first up, back by popular demand, and I am so glad he is here, um, Dr. Tapson, Dr. Victor Tapson. He is the professor of medicine at Cedars-Sinai. He's a pulmonologist. He knows more about this than all of us put together. He is a medical professional, and he's going to give us a lot of good guidance, and we're going to talk to him. Also uh, in the house is JT Lasker. JT is the Vice President of Programming and of Acquisitions at ESPN. He's also a pulmonary embolism survivor. Um, he also shares a blood clotting disorder with me and that's Factor V Leiden. So he's gonna talk a little bit about that. And last but certainly not least, Caleb Benson, American Ninja Warrior. Thanks for being here, man, because uh, Caleb has been part of a Facebook Live before, but he has been wearing the polka dots and he's been out there doing some extreme stuff physically, showing you that life does not end after a blood clot. You can still do things, so we're going to talk to him as well. Um, coming up a little later, we're going to ask some specific questions. You guys can also ask some questions in the chat box, and uh, we'll try to get to, many, as, to as many as possible. We'll try to wrap this up after an hour. 
but if it runs a little long, you're more than welcome to stay on board. So, uh, and my name's Todd Robertson. I probably should have told you that. I'm with the board, uh, with the National Blood Clot Alliance. I'm on the board of directors, also a advisor for the Sports and Wellness Institute and a blood clot survivor. I'll tell you a little bit about my story later on. But right now, like I said, back by popular demand, Dr. Victor Tapson, we're so glad you're here, man. And uh, we'd like you to uh, introduce yourself and can you kind of give us your medical background where you're from, what, what you've done in the medical world, what ties you into the blood clot space? Sure, Todd, I'll be very brief, Todd. It's great to see all of you, by the way, and Todd. Todd knows a lot more about blood clots than many of us. He's, he's uh, been, been learned, learned about blood clots over several decades now, so he's a pretty sharp guy, blood clot expert. JT and Caleb, great to see you, and Julia, and everyone out there. I saw a couple of my colleagues uh, um, out there, their names on there from Cedars, which is nice to see people on there. Um, I was probably saw my first pulmonary embolism in 1982 when I was an intern. A young, unfortunate pregnant, pregnant woman died of PE after being sent home from the ED once. Uh, sent home saying that she was short of breath because she'd gained too much weight during her pregnancy. And she came back to ED and died. And I remembered that. And uh, when, I, when I got to Duke University on the faculty in 1990, very interested in blood clots, started doing research. So I've been seeing patients with pulmonary embolism almost every day uh, since 1990, except a few weekends. Um, we have a pulmonary embolism response team. Um, I went from Duke to Cedars-Sinai about eight years ago. And uh, I'm still seeing pulmonary embolism commonly, frequently, DVT and PE, seeing patients in the, in the hospital and then following them up in clinic. Uh, so it's been a very interesting area for me, Todd. I'm really glad to be here and be able to talk to you folks, but uh, a disease I think about a lot. And, and by the way, I, I joined forces with Anari Medical, who's done a lot for this, uh, this disease as well back in October. So I'm working with them on, on raising awareness and doing some different things and uh, still seeing patients at Cedars, although a few less now. Cool. Well, I hope you don't mind if I call you Vic. I feel like I've, I've, known, I've known you for a while now. And Otherwise, I'm going to call you Mr. Robertson. You better call me <laughs> and, and, and you were part of a, a pep talk before, which uh, I got to tell you, we, we got so much positive response out of you being on. And uh, to have you there answering some of those questions was huge. So thank you again for being here. We're going to circle back to you in a few minutes so we can actually uh, start some, some medical talk on, on your end. Um, next up, I want to introduce my friend JT Lasker. JT Lasker is on the board of directors at the National Blood Clot Alliance, and he is with ESPN. He's also a PE survivor. I'm going to let him tell you more about himself. JT, thanks for coming, man. Yeah, thanks, Todd. And just th thank you to you and, and Dr. Tapson and, and RE Medical and NBCA. And, and you know, I could tell you two years ago when I experienced my almost two years ago, my experience, my DBT and PE, you know, having a, a platform and an opportunity like this, you know, to get information and talk to other survivors and folks that are dealing with this very difficult, uh, complicated and, and scary situation uh, would have been invaluable to me. So thank you for, for doing this. And hopefully everybody uh, on this call appreciates this, uh, this conversation. Um, so JT Lasker, um, just, just a little bit quickly about me, 46-year-old uh, male living in uh, central Connecticut here, about uh, a couple miles outside of Bristol, Connecticut, which is the headquarters of ESPN, which Todd mentioned. Uh, I'm, I work as a vice president in the content group there, been there for 23 years, uh, live in Connecticut here with my, my wife and four uh, beautiful daughters. Um, and like I said, I experienced my, uh, my DVT and, and PE, uh, in July of 2020. Um, I think it's important to note the, the, the timing there being, uh, only about four months into, you know, the current pandemic, um, which was in itself a very scary situation. Um, and I'll go through some of the, some of the, the, the sort of, you know, quick sort of steps I think that I experienced in a lot of cases in, when I think about it. It's mostly a, um, a sort of retrospective view on all the, the things that I was dealing with and not realizing. And maybe as a, as a male and, and sort of you know, being a little bit bravado or, or blaming some things on age or, or other things that I might be, have been doing in my life, but put, piecing it all together, it's, it's very easy to see what I was sort of experiencing and wish I had the knowledge ahead of time to, to recognize what was happening you know, to me in the, in the time that it was. And also, uh, even so, lucky to be here, you know, with y'all to be able to talk about it. So, um, it was July 2020. Um, I was a you know avid runner, uh, working out all the time. So I was a relatively fit guy uh, at 45 years old. Um, was experiencing some calf pain, um, which was a, a normal thing for you know for a runner. Thought I just strained my calf muscle uh, for a couple of weeks there. Tried to tried to you know fix it. it wouldn't go away. 
sort of kept brushing it off as, as old age. Um, as that sort of, I tried to ignore that. My, my, uh, my workouts started getting very sluggish, uh, not feeling really well, not loss of breath that I was able to notice or anything, but just not feeling really well. Um, and, you know, at the end of July, this is after two or three weeks of just experiencing these things. At the end of July, uh, I was out with my family, came home from a you know, late night, a late drive, had really bad leg pain, got out of the car, picked up my daughter who was sleeping, a seven-year-old kid, about 40 pounds, um, you know, pick her up. She's you know, dead asleep. I bring her up a, a flight of stairs and I get to the top of the stairs and I almost fall down the stairs because I can't breathe. Um, spent the night, uh, in my bedroom by myself, um, you trying to, you know, searching on, on Google, you know, do I, am I having a heart attack? Like what is happening to me? Started experiencing really terrible searing, uh, chest pain, you know, coming on and off, depending on sort of how I was moving, um, made it through the night, um, called my doctor, uh, the next morning. Uh, explained my symptoms. They told me to go directly to the to the emergency room, which um, I really didn't want to do. Again, it was it was the the pandemic, um, and the last place I wanted to be was in the middle of a hospital um, where you know seemingly was ground zero, if you will, for you know for the COVID uh, COVID virus. And in my mind, things I was telling myself was it's just agita, it's just you know, heartburn, you know, it could be any of those things. And why I put myself in danger if it's, this is something that's just going to go away. And I might walk out of the hospital with something worse than I walked in with. Mm-hmm. Um, my wife um, begged me to go. Uh, I drove myself to the emergency room that next morning. They immediately admitted me. Um, I will say out of all the doctors that I've had experiences with since, since I've been through all of this, the emergency room doctor, I, I wish I remembered his name, was absolutely incredible. Um, and he, once I got into the emergency room, the first thing he did is he pulled his chair up, sat next to me, and I, I remember this, he put his five fingers up and he said, what you're dealing with could be one of five things. And I cannot remember what those four other things were. The last thing he said to me was it could be a blood clot. And he said, it could be a 5% chance that you have a blood clot. I think he took maybe a look at me and said, there's no way you have a blood clot. It's probably one of these other things. But he said, over the next couple of hours, we're going to knock all these things down until we were done with, until we find that one thing. Um, and he did, he, they found it. It was effectively the last thing, you know, on the list. Um, and they found a blood clot in my right leg. It was a DVT that was, you know, behind my knee, uh, going all the way down to my ankle. Um, which then led them to take, you know, some, um, because of the chest, the chest issues I was having, they took uh, an x-ray of my chest and found multiple PEs in my chest, um, including an infarct in my chest, which was terrible from a pain perspective. uh, But I actually think it saved my life uh, because the pain that I was experiencing, if I didn't have that pain, I'm not sure if I ever would have made my way to the hospital. Um, So, that was my story. I wound up being in the hospital for about three days. Um, uh, after that, um, did a bunch of work uh, thereafter. Had and Todd, we can talk about this more. You know, had to really become a a self advocate. The the scariest part of this whole situation for me, which is why I'm so happy to be here with everybody, is when I walked out of the hospital. I had no clue what happened to me. Had no idea how to deal with it and didn't know sort of how to just navigate the rest of my life now that this had happened. And especially being told that I was an unprovoked case, which was, hey, you got hit with a sniper shot, but nobody knows why. And, and that was really, really scary. Um, you did mention this, Todd, um, and I forgot to mention it, is what I did find out, um, which was at least one piece of the puzzle, uh, was that I was factor, that I do have factor five Leiden, um, which, again, I think in Dr. Tapson, you can, you know, this better than anybody is doesn't, doesn't cause blood clots, just makes me more susceptible, you know, to them in, the, in whatever it is that I was doing to, you know, to make this happen to me. Yeah. And you, uh, so, so, you, I mean, you suffered some of that emotional impact, right? And, you, and you, you touched on how men, you know, and even I back in, back in the early day, I was dismissing a lot of this because I thought I was a tough guy. Yeah. And, and now I recognize that is it's really broken thinking and we cannot we cannot 
present ourselves that way when it comes to medical issues. We have to speak up. We've got to be our own advocate. It is absolutely necessary. But uh, Factor Five Leiden, yeah, you know, it's uh, it's something that you have to be careful with. Even though you're, I mean, heterozygous and homozygous are a little bit different. And Dr. Uh, Bick, you can you can touch on this, but it doesn't matter. You you still have an increased risk, and you have to be careful with those risk factors. So, Vic, do you have anything to add about uh, yeah, yeah. Factor Five Leiden yeah, or yeah, any blood right. quantum disorder? You hit the nail right on the head there, Todd. You know, technically, you're unprovoked, JT. People could argue not even to test you for anything because we know we're going to treat you indefinitely. I don't like to use the term forever because in, in five years, JT, we might know that there's some other point mutation you have. We might, we might have a cure. We might have a gene therapy for uh, what you have. So uh, right. I, I think, but until further notice, you got to be on a blood thinner. Um, a couple of quick things. I think you're obviously an intelligent guy. You were, still didn't really want to go in. I kind of wish the doctor sounds like he did a good job. I'm not going to be critical. I kind of wish as soon as you told him you had some calf pain and shortness of breath, he would have said, this is very likely the most likely thing you have. I'm going to start you on a blood thinner now, even before I do a test on you. Yeah. If the suspicion's really high and the bleed risk seems to be low, getting someone on a blood thinner is, is, is important because it's been shown that blood thinners clearly save lives. If your blood thinner um, is given early on, you've got a better chance to survive. So I'm so glad you went in. And I think that's probably the most important thing that this, if, you had, if you had crushing substernal chest pain in the middle of your chest that went down your, your left arm, you'd say, the doctor would say to me, this is a heart attack, we got it covered. If you said, suddenly I can't uh, walk, my, right, my right, right side of my body's paralyzed, they'd have known it was a stroke. But this is such a difficult disease. And he's right. It could have been some different things for sure. But you come in and how many people get a pain in their calf? Do we run to the ED every time? I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, the disease really sucks in that way because it can present so many different ways. Like you said, you had that pain. It probably hurt me. You took a deep breath. If, if you didn't have that pain, maybe you waited another day and maybe you wouldn't be here, JT. So yeah. I'm really glad they sorted you out. But we got to find a way to raise awareness so people out there understand that you can come in there and have, uh, I, I have a patient from Hawaii um, that I'd seen before. He was in Hawaii, had had uh, sudden onset chest pain like you're having in shortness of breath. Saw five different doctors. They, they did an EKG on him. They did a stress test. Then they sent him to a nephrologist, a urologist because they thought he might have kidney stones. They finally diagnosed him before he was uh, uh, fortunately in, in, in time to take care of him. So the key message there, JT, is, is I'm glad you got to a doctor. We got to educate people more about the symptoms. And uh, like Todd said, you know, factor five light, it, it increases your risk. Um, but in that in and of itself wouldn't necessarily make us treat you forever. Now, if you're a homozygote, you got a copy of the gene from each parent, we'd very likely be more aggressive and treat you forever. But the fact that you were unprovoked, this came out of the blue, you got a clot very easily. You're a runner for crying out loud. You got a clot easily. So um, that means if you got a clot that easily, we got to keep you on a blood thinner. And there's some nice things we can do longer term. Um, the six month mark, you can be considered for a lower dose of uh, Xeralto or Eliquis or what, you know, one of those two drugs if you're on one, uh, one of those, just because uh, we've got some good studies now suggesting that will lower the bleed risk and still protect you. So right. I'm glad you're with us, JT. I'm glad you went to the doc. <laughs> Thanks, doctor. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Yeah, and, I'm, and Vic, I'm glad you touched on the, you know, when, when people say I'm a lifer on an anticoagulant, that, that it, it does bother me a little bit because it sounds so permanent and we don't know what the future ho holds. And I think we should be put more of a positive spin on it. And you were talking about dropping down to 10 milligrams. So me being homozygous, I've been on Xeralto 20 milligram now for 12 years, almost 12 years, ever since the FDA approved it. And they're not ready to drop me down to that 10 milligram yet because like my doctor always says, dude, you clot like a truck's tailpipe in quicksand. That's where I got that saying. It's like, we can't drop you to 10 milligrams. I know that I clot in three days if I'm off. This has already happened. We've already ridden that bull in the rodeo. It's like, so, but I still look at it as like you said, Vic, we don't know what what's down the road 10 years from now, 15 years from now. But if I have to take Xeralto for the rest of my life, okay, fine. I'm doing great on it. it. I'm not. I'm not suffering a blood clot. So to me, it is an excellent medication. Uh, JT, did, I, I'm sorry if I missed this. Did you say what anticoagulant you were on? I'm on Xarelto. Um, and and to that point, I mean, it it is. I, I buy into it being a lifesaver, you know, for me, especially in my situation. And Todd, you're a different situation, but it's a lifesaver for you as well. And yeah. I think a, a lot of us, you know, people, males, I think in particular, though 
are, are hesitant. You know, I, I, I in particular was, I did not want to take, I do not like taking medicine. I don't want yeah. to put something in my body that I don't need, I um, but came to terms with, and it took me a while, you know, months, you know, for me to, to, you know, get over everything that I was dealing with, but, the, and, and actually the medicine in, in a large degree finally gave me comfort after I realized that I was okay and I wasn't getting any recurrences and I was taking the medicine, I did, I did have a sense of, of being, you know, protected and can move on with my life. Yeah, that, that, that's the dose, right. The dose of varies, like Todd said, there's something, we don't, we don't have big studies on homozygous people with factor V Leiden. We don't know if, if we can drop the dose there. Patients with active cancer that have blood clots, better not to drop the dose in six months. So your doctor has to look at you and make a decision. Is it safe? Is it not? Take all the characters into account and then make a decision. So uh, yeah, uh, sounds like your docs are on top of things. Yeah, yeah, and I and I think this is a, and this is what I say. And Vic, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think anybody should develop a false sense of security just because they're on an anticoagulant. I see. I think you need to develop good habits. Yes. And what I mean by that is we need to continue to eliminate risk factors, and we need to continue to try to live a healthy life and get proper blood flow. To me, proper blood flow stimulation is the all-time best natural blood clot preventer that, that, that there is. We can't do it 24 seven, but that's just one of the things. And uh, another thing is when it comes to Xeralto, and Vic, I just want, I want you to confirm this for me because um, sometimes I'll, I'll, I'll see people saying, well, my doctor didn't tell me about this, but I'm always having to tell people, look, man, you're, you're on 15 or 20 milligrams Xeralto. It's clear that you need to be eating with it. You need to take in food to make it the most effective that it's going to be. Because I see a lot of people going, well, I take it on an empty stomach and I'm fine. And it's like, that's not the message to put out there. So I just want to know. So you have to have food with it. Can, can you tell me how much food do you think you would need? Now it's with 15 and 20 milligrams only. 10 milligrams Zeralto does not need food intake. But when it comes to the higher doses, how much food do you think someone needs? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the compromise is, is Todd, I, you don't need a full meal, a big meal. It should be more than just a little bite of something. It shouldn't be one or two bites of something. It should be a small snack, at least a snack, and you'll get better absorption. Uh, and, and, and that's, it, it may be feasible on 15 or 20. You might get enough in you to be protective. We don't like to take a chance. So 15 or 20, like you said, Todd, got a food in your stomach. It should be a reasonable amount. It does not have to be a big meal with vegetables and potatoes and meat or whatever, um, but but got to be some, some food in your stomach. And like you said, with 10 milligrams, you're kind of off the hook there. And then with the other popular drug, Eliquis, so and Eliquis are both very good drugs for this. You don't need to worry about the food issue, but it's a right. twice a day drug in the long term. So there's a trade off for you. That's right. That's right. Eliquis didn't work for me, not because it wasn't a good anticoagulant, but my lifestyle and occupation twice daily consistently did not work. So with Zeralto, I'm taking it with dinner. So it, it does come with a big plate of food, but that's sure. my time to take it. So it's like habit. It's like, that's when I take it. Boom, boom, boom. Um, so yeah, great. Uh, so great information. JT, thanks for sharing your story. Please uh, jump in anytime you want uh, when we go to our next guest here, if you have a question, uh, but thanks guys. So uh, I want to introduce our next guest and let him tell his story because it's pretty cool. I uh, met this guy last year when we uh, did a Facebook Live. And actually, uh, one of my colleagues at the National Blood Clot Alliance was watching American Ninja Warrior at the time and was just kind of listening in the background. And somebody talked about him having a pulmonary embolism. So whenever we hear that, it's like, whoa, this guy had a PE. Uh, Caleb Benson. Uh, from down here. south. Hey, how you doing, man? Thanks hey, for being here. Thank you, thank you. I'm yeah, super yeah. excited to be here. Yeah. Hey, tell us your uh, blood clotting story and and also oh. what you're doing down there with Flipside Ninja with your gym and yeah. your status with American Ninja and all that stuff. <laughs> I think smartest use of my time is to be pitching Ninja Warrior to JT um, since he's <laughs> with the SBA. <laughs> I'm just joking. I won't do that right now. Um, so yeah. Uh, I, my story kind of became known from uh, American Ninja Warrior while they kind of mentioned right before I hit the water that uh, I am a blood clot survivor. Um, I'm unprovoked. Uh, I'll make this kind of short and sweet because I know everybody really has a lot of questions. So, um, and that's like the most important thing. So um, I'm unprovoked. Um, it was shortly after we had my daughter. Um, I I've, I've normally have cramps just because I'm narcoleptic and some of the medications. So I never paid attention to any leg cramps, calf cramps or anything like that um, because it was kind of a part of my normal thing with pro vigil or new vigil, whichever I was on because of my narcolepsy. Um, but I do remember um, it was 
a lot of a lot of sitting around um and I've, I've been athletic beforehand um but we have my daughter so i was sitting around a lot um of course and sleeping a lot um and i remember one night uh, i was having a hard time just breathing without pain and so I had, I've, I've gotten pleurisy before from an injury um and so i was like oh it's just pleurisy i'm gonna try to sleep it off um, so I, I went in, I told, I told my wife, I was like, Hey, you know, I'm just going to go, I'm going to go lay down, um, and take some, you know, Tylenol or whatnot. And, um, it got to the point to where I could not lay down anymore. Uh, the pain was too much. Um, so I ended up was walking around sitting in the living room, like waiting for it to go away and was like, you know what, I'm just they've they've got stuff that it'll give me better like anti-inflammation all this kind of stuff so i went to the emergency room and i told them you know i can't i can't even move without my lungs just screaming in pain and so i told him i was like i think it's pleurisy um and kind of tried to guide the doctor um i am so so lucky that the doctor did not listen to a word that i said <laughs> um and he was like listen we're gonna we're gonna kind of just do a little bit of everything, test it, see what's going on. And that's when he came back. I can't remember what the blood test was, but he was like, we're going to have to bring you back, check you for a blood clot. Um, sure enough, I had two small uh, PEs, one in each lung, um, and they kept me there um, for a little while, put me on Eliquis, um, and then told me my ninja training was done. Um, and follow up with my uh, primary doctor and then pulmonologist, all that kind of fun stuff. Um, and I was like, oh, um, I felt kind of alone. I didn't know the National Blood Clot Alliance even existed. Um, and so finding out about you guys now, like, and just trying to help spread the word, I'm super excited about because it's an awesome resource. Um, I think my biggest thing was trying to figure out what happened. Um, I, we didn't end up finding anything with the blood test as far as what caused it. I was on Eloquist for six months. Um, and after six months, we lowered my dose and I'm uh, off Eloquist now completely with a low dose um, aspirin um, and now training back full time for Ninja Warrior and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I think my biggest takeaway for everybody from this is number one, be, be an advocate for yourself. Also listen to your doctor. Um, and then afterwards is depressing. Um, and I think being in the right mindset of being like, hey, this is this is what I do. I, I did Ninja Warrior and that was my life. And they were like, hey, you can't take any big falls um, or anything like that. So you're going to have to really look at what you want to do. Um, and that was terrifying. And it's hard to admit, especially when you want to be kind of the athlete, you know, the tough guy is just to be like, well, now I'm just going to sit around and be depressed all the time. Right. Um, and I think the biggest thing is to, um, I hate using the word motivation. Motivation comes after, um, discipline, um, and after movement. Right. Um, and so I tell everybody is like set small goals, whatever it is and start chasing that. Um, it, I was way, way, way off of my prime, off my peak. I'm sure JT was the same. <laughs> He's like, I was running all the time, right? Yep. And all of a sudden, you're like, uh-oh. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so... I, it, like, just ahead. walking. I mean, to, to your point of, you know, just small goals, like, I, just walking a few steps would knock my breath out. Yeah. Um, and they, I don't know if they sent you home with one of those those breather things to to train your your lungs, but... At least they gave me something to sort of like compete against. Right? Well, That's cool. Lungs better. Yeah. No, I didn't get that. And I remember <laughs> just like, you know, going to get the mail was difficult. Right. And I was like, oh, my gosh, what am I going to do? Um, and that was huge for me. And I think everybody needs to be aware of that um, is that, number one, if you're just like recovering on the backside, listen to your doctor. Um, but it's not the end. Um, really, really like focus on yourself, focus on your mindset, um, and then try to just start moving, um, and, and work on getting healthy again. Um, it's difficult. I think it's one of the hardest things that anybody, as soon as you get an injury or you get out, um, is to come back from that, but it is yeah. so, so worth it. Um, and that's kind of my message that I like to tell people is that 
um, just just keep on moving, uh, work with your doctor and really set goals and get out there. Um, but yeah. Yeah, you know, it's 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 hard to it's hard to look at it as a speed bump and not a roadblock at first, um, especially when you are in pain and you're filled with post clot PTSD. But my message would be similar. It's like just know that it is a speed bump because sooner or later you are going to be the shining light and you are going to be helping other people through recovery because most of us make it through this. And so I think we get caught up on statistics, um, on the bad things. We're, we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But uh, great message, man. And uh, yeah. how's, the, how's the gym going down there? Gym's going good. I, I run Flipside Ninja Park, um, and it's fantastic. We're busy as all get out, uh, looking to expand as soon as we can uh, get rock and roll. But everything's looking good to move forward with that. Um, cool. So I'm excited for everything in the future. So, yeah. Well, uh, good luck to you, and uh, if you can hang out for the rest of the show, we hope we hope you will, and absolutely uh, hop in wherever you want to ask a question. Uh, for this last 25 minutes or so, we're going to be concentrating on, on some questions for Vic, and we're going to have him uh, talk about reoccurrence rate for men and things like that. Um, real quick, I'm just going to give my three or four minute story just so people know that th this varies so much between from one patient to another. You can't compare your story and what you're going through necessarily with the next person. Uh, when it comes to blood clot trauma, it's just all over the board and, and all of our situations are unique. So I'm a six time blood clot survivor. Uh, I watched my mom drop dead in 1984 when I was trying to get her to the hospital. She died within oh, probably 10 seconds. Um, you, you hear that old saying, dead before you hit the floor. Uh, that's what happened to my mom. She was dead before she hit the ground. And we didn't think too much of it then. I remember hearing pulmonary embolism, but uh, she, you know, uh, I, I was in a single parent household. So I wasn't processing the medical side of it. All I knew is I lost my mom. And I didn't connect all this up until later on and even though I'm factor five Leiden homozygous, I didn't even suffer my first blood clot until I was almost 47 years old. Had I, I still believe to this day, had I not got a serious bloodletting injury, I don't know if I would have ever suffered a blood clot yet. I think I might have made it my whole life without suffering one, even though I was factor five Leiden homozygous. But that injury was kind of like a trigger. And once I clotted, then it just kept happening. And then I had to deal with warfarin failure and some other things. Uh, but yeah, six blood clots. Um, my pulmonary embolism was in 2017. That was all due. And I'm not afraid to admit it. It was doctor error because had I been my own advocate then, like I am now, I would have questioned what happened to me leading up to that pulmonary embolism, which was I was given a colonoscopy, my first colonoscopy, knowing my blood clot history and that I was factor five Leiden, they still stopped me for three days on Xeralto. Boom suffered a pulmonary embolism. Um, so now I have a colonoscopy every three years because I grow polyps like, like ditch weed. So every three years I have to have a colonoscopy, but I'm off one day. I can, so that showed me right there that I cannot be off of an anticoagulant um, for, for three days. Um, but I had that pulmonary embolism before the PE, I was a little nonchalant about the blood clots. I remember talking to one doctor going, well, you know, I, I missed my anticoagulant a couple of days. I, I, missed, I used to call it blood thinner back then. I missed my blood thinner a couple of days. That's no big deal, right? And she got in my face and shook her finger like a mother and said, look, you don't realize how, such, how, how dangerous and lethal your situation is. And she really turned it around for me. Uh, she was that doctor that really lit my fire. And it made me become my own best advocate. I've been one ever since. And even though I'm kind of explosive when it comes to blood clots, I gotta be honest with you, I don't think I'm ever gonna suffer an abnormal blood clot again. I say that because I've developed confidence. I control my anxiety now. I have faith in Xeralto. I have faith in my doctor team. I have faith in the protocol that I use to prevent blood clots. I don't just let the anticoagulant do all the work. Okay, I bike 200 miles a week in the summer. I'm a canoe and kayak instructor. I've got to stay fit. I try to do things that are good habit to help prevent blood clots. So, you know, that's just the way I choose to think. I put a positive spin on it. I don't think I'm going to suffer one again. But if I do, this is where coming, being fit and uh, knowing your health and trying to be as healthy as possible, that where it comes, that's where it comes into play. Because I think recovery is a big thing. 
And if you, you, we, we all suffer a blood clot, no matter what kind of an athlete or how healthy we are. Serena Williams did it. Chris Bosh did it in the NBA. I mean, you did it, Caleb. JT did it. We were pretty athletic people. That doesn't mean we're not going to get a blood clot. That is absolutely no guarantee. But what I do believe is it helps the recovery process and may make that a little easier. Um, Vic, I want to ask you one thing. When it comes to exercise, is it true that exercise can actually maybe speed up the process just a little bit when it comes to blood clot absorption? Well, yeah, I think I think it's 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 a it's a double-edged sword, really, Todd. Because when someone has a big blood clot, if you got clot left in that clot DBT or PE and clot left in your leg, those first few days, if it's extensive clot going way up into your thigh, you shouldn't walk around. Walk around the kitchen, go to the bathroom. I have doctors say, well, they got the clot because they were immobilized or they weren't walking around much. I'm gonna have them walk in the hall. We don't want people exercising and have that clot. It reminds me of of the creek in my neighborhood. It turned into a river, the rainstorm, and I'm seeing these 10 foot logs go down the river. You don't want to get your cardiac output, your blood flowing too much in the first few days after a clot. Um, and there's a lot of mis- there's not a lot of good studies about that. Just be cautious, do the things you need to do, and don't start exercising for a few weeks after the blood clot. Do what you need to do, but don't start. Ex- now, if you've got no clot left in your leg and you have pulmonary embolism, then getting around and walking as long as you're not too short of breath is okay to do. Yeah, and we're going to talk about absorption for blood clots here pretty soon, too. But I, I will say that I think my pulmonologist is my favorite doctor of all time because he's the one that just seemed to know more, more about it than, than anybody. And he actually put me on an exercise plan. Uh, my PE dissolved in about six weeks. Mm-hmm. So that, that was pretty cool. And so I was able to go back and hit the bike and, and start running again pretty much right away. Uh, but my pulmonologist uh, was a true godsend. Um, Real quick, before we get into all the questions and stuff, I do want to talk about the emotional uh, impact that this has. And Vic and and JT and Caleb, you can touch on this too. I want you to know that uh, I was diagnosed with post-clot PTSD by name. That's that's why I use it so much now because I was actually diagnosed with it in 2017. And I'm not sure if that was because my wife had just died of brain cancer. I was already in a grieving state to where I was already depressed. And then I was dealing with blood clots on top of it. It was like, I, I felt like I had a rope around my neck and it was my time. But after nine months of counseling, I'm just telling people if they have a, a serious anxiety that just seems to consume them, for months and months. Don't let it fester like an infected blister. Uh, talk to somebody about it. Um, that emotional trauma is, is, is really bad. So a few things that I've learned, um, the things I worry about usually never happen. So try to remember that when you're worried about after you've had a blood clot, well, gee, I think I'm going to drop dead in the middle of the night. The things you worry about usually don't happen. Um, I learned to put a positive spin on everything. I'm into exercise, meditation, deep breathing exercises, nature bathing, all that you can use to help you feel better. Remember that exercise when you're allowed to do so, like Vic said, if the doctor's given you a green light to exercise, those feel good endorphins that are released gives you a temporary buzz and it actually makes you feel better. So exercise is a really good thing. But a few things about Dr. Google, people will always say, well, you know, I just got out of the hospital and the first thing I did was was start looking up statistics. If your anxiety is bad, you do not want to be using Dr. Google for anything. If you have your anxiety under control, I think the internet is a great resource to use. That's how I found stoptheplot.org, right? That's how I found National Blood Plot Alliance. But you got to be really careful. I I think there's three basic rules, Vic. Um, If you're going to look on the internet, you're going to be searching up something about blood clots. First of all, learn to cross-reference everything. You don't take the first thing that you read and just run with it and go, that's what I've got. That's what's going to happen to me. I think... uh, you know, going to reliable sources like stoptheclot.org. I think that's another big one. Um, And then, you know, take that information that you're reading about, take it to your doctor right away. And just remember that you see 25% of pulmonary embolism patients die sudden death from their blood clot. Try to look at the bright side. 75% of us survive. Try to find that positive thing about it because you're probably going to be okay. So um, I, emotional, that emotional impact really is big for everybody. And Vic, you've probably seen a lot, a lot of this with your patients, right? Absolutely. I think, I think one thing patients should keep in mind is once you're on a blood thinner, you're seeing a doctor, you're on the right dose of a blood thinner, your chance of dying from a clot again is exceedingly low. 
One, right. you, you could have another one. It's rare to die from a blood clot when you're on a standard dose of blood thinner. So that's really important. To, it should help reduce anxiety some. And some people do have shortness of breath after a blood clot. If they do, in three months, we got to take a look again. Scan them again if you're having symptoms. We don't have a lot of evidence to scan people again if they don't have symptoms. Some people want it because it relieves some anxiety to see things are gone. Right. About 70% right. uh, of people have some degree of clot present at two to three weeks still. Uh, at a year, about 25% of people, if you scan, will have some clot there. Doesn't mean it's causing problems, may never cause problems. It means you ought to stay on a blood thinner. But generally yeah. speaking, we have pretty good decision making about staying on a blood thinner without re imaging people. I've seen that question pop up in the chat a few times. If you're having symptoms, you got to be re imaged. If you're having symptoms in your legs, you know, pain in your legs, post thrombotic syndrome. Nowadays, the last five, six years, we've had things we can do with that that often helps that we couldn't do before in terms of getting clot out. So I think anyone that's having post thrombotic syndrome should consider seeing their doctor and not only being on a blood thinner, but just being evaluated to see if there any, anything else could be done. So I think there's a lot of things we can do to reduce anxiety. And sometimes this post PE shortness of breath, as we call it, post PE dyspnea, sometimes isn't due to the blood clot. You, you get better from your blood clot, you realize you've gained 20 pounds, you're deconditioned or something like that. So yeah. docs have to look this over carefully and make some decisions about you. And, and But you're right, Todd, that anxiety has got to be dealt with because being on a blood thinner should give you a lot more confidence you're going right. to do okay. Yeah. Okay. So enough about that. So let, let's talk about, a lot. there's a, a lot of questions out there regarding recurrence of blood clots being higher in men than women. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Sure. So this is a disease of men and women. It is not a disease of men. It's a disease of men and women. But there are certain situations where either women or men have higher risk. You get breast cancer, your risk is higher. On oral contraceptives, your risk is higher. Um, you're on postmenopause hormonal therapy, your risk is higher if you're a woman. If you're a man, and it seems like women at younger ages are higher risk for clots because of some of these things, oral contraceptive, pregnancy. Pregnancy is a risk. Um, men, um, as things get, as you get a little older, the risk seems to be higher in men. Um, we know we know there's some data now, a good study from Sweden a few years ago, several studies now show if you're taller, your risk is a little higher. It's not super high. Most NBA players don't get clots. It's very few. I know four or five that have gotten blood clots, but it's unusual. But it's still higher. If you're six five, your risk is higher than if you're five three. And men are a little taller. So that could be one reason why men are more likely to get clots. We see in Los Angeles that everyone wants to be fit. I guess they do everywhere now, but for some reason in LA, it seems like everyone wants to be fit. And men just, some men want to take this testosterone. If you have a low testosterone level, it's okay to take it. If, you're, uh, if, you're, if your levels are normal, um, then, and you take testosterone on top of that, your risk of blood clots is higher. The FDA slapped a, a warning on that years ago. So, well, again, if you're low and you're replacing it, it's okay. If you're not, your risk is higher to get a blood. So testosterone is one reason men may get clots more than women. There's a couple of studies that have shown that um, recurrence rates for some reason, you put everybody on their blood clot, on their blood thinner, and they had three months, six months where people come off their blood thinner. It seems like men are more likely to recur than women. And that still remains a little bit of a mystery. Is it the height thing? Is it testosterone? Is it the men are a little older? Are the studies imbalanced? It's older men and younger women. I'm not sure anyone really knows I thought for a while, my experience with my patients has been with my tens of thousands of thousands of patients over the years, is that men tend to be a little more likely to miss their doses of medicine. I think women tend to be a little more responsible than we are. I don't know. But so they tend to be a little more non-compliant. And like JT mentioned earlier, I don't want to be on this thing. And maybe I'll miss it for a couple of days, see how I feel. I do think that's one thing we see sometimes, but I think it's still a bit of a mystery. Yeah. But you know, men get prostate cancer, women don't. Cancer increases the risk of, of clotting and some, some cancers and prostate cancer is a very common cancer. Most men over 80 probably have a few little specks of prostate cancer in there somewhere. You know, so so those are some of the things, Todd, just to be, to be brief about it. But I think the bottom line, we all have to be careful. We're all at risk. But I think men, we got to be, we got to learn to be a little, uh, you know, a little more careful about taking care of medicines and things, I think. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, this is probably a good time to remind guys that if they haven't got their PSA levels or their digital rectal exam, uh, what, what age do you have, since we're talking about cancer, prostate cancer is huge. Uh, what age do they have to start uh, getting there and watching their levels and getting that rectal you know, exam? One thing to pay attention to is family history. If family history, uh, younger, you should get it earlier. You know, when people start you know, and you got colonoscopies, prostate checks for women, breast checks are really important. When you're 60, every man probably should have a PSA check. And sometimes your PSA, the prostate antigen, will go up just because you've got a little bit of a swollen prostate. 
Um, but you got to get it followed up and you got to make sure it's not prostate cancer. Your doc says, look, this is going up a little more. We got to have you see a urologist. You might need a biopsy, et cetera. So I think yeah. most family practice docs are really good. You see your doctor once a year, every six months, they're pretty good about telling you, you need to get your colonoscopy, you need to get screened, you need to get your yeah. prostate checked. So I think one thing is make sure you see your family doctor on a regular basis. And us men are bad about that. I, I certainly am. Yeah, well, it's good. We're talking a little bit about cancer because cancer and blood clots are, are definitely directly uh, related. Um, and, and I also notice uh, uh, you were mentioning before, um, and women do this too. I've seen, I know a lot of women video game players. There's a lot of guy video game players out there that'll play for hours without moving and uh, they end up getting a blood clot. That, that could be a threat also. It's a high risk factor, right, Vic? Yeah, I think so. We, we had a, a young teenage kid, 16 year old, who's what mom told me he played video games 12 hours a day, died of pulmonary embolism. So clearly we're a society now that sits a lot, does a lot. Just since laptops came out and computers, I've seen so many people, I've sat on my computer 15 hours, I'm writing a grant, I'm doing a project for work, getting clots. So we do got to get up and move around. Someone like Caleb, a very active guy, probably doesn't have to worry about that too much. Any of us flying a long flight, you know, uh, yeah. get up, move around, stay hydrated. Don't let yourself get too hydrated, things like this. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Do you see that question uh, about that testosterone medication that came through? Um, it's, uh, I, and I can't I can't even pronounce it. A-S-H-W-A. Ashwagandha. Yeah. So someone asked, uh, they take it for anxiety. It also boosts testosterone. People are asking if they should still be taking that. What do you think? Um, so yeah, I think, I think we got to be a little careful for anything that well, there, there's a few, there's a few herbal medicines, non FDA approved medicines out there. We got to be careful with, you know, I, I warn people that curcumin or turmeric, probably not a great drug to take. If you're on a blood thinner, it might tend to make you bleed more easily. Probably not substantially. If you're really into your tumor, some of my patients just swear by it, it makes them feel better. I tell them this drug, you know, anything that might increase testosterone, if your testosterone levels are already normal, probably not a great thing to take. We don't have data saying whether that drug will increase the clotting risk or not, but anything that increases testosterone, I think you should be a little cautious about, um, sure. uh, you know, if, if you're already on a blood thinner, it's not as big a deal. If you're not, then your risk is higher. Okay. Uh, another question that came in from uh, one of our viewers here, what leads to say an anticoagulant like Xeralto instead of warfarin? So, you know, right now we've got good data that patients with blood clots, whether DVT or PE, can be on Xeralto or Eliquis instead of warfarin. Most of them can. There's a few situations we're careful. We've learned even in cancer patients, it used to be shots, low molecular heparin, low Vinox. You'd be shots for the rest of your life. And now we know that the DOAX, as we call them, that the um, direct oral anticoagulants, Eliquis and, and Xeralto, are as good as these shots for cancer patients. There's one situation, it's kind of an unusual thrombophilia. Some of you might have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. You have that. If you're what we call triple positive, all three of the tests come back positive. That's one, one interesting situation where we found you probably ought to be on warfarin. If you've got a metal heart valve. Um, you should be on warfarin instead of, uh, but these, these drugs are also an eloquence now are nice because as you know, you don't have to monitor them. Coumadin, warfarin, you got to monitor it. Some people, if they fail a blood thinner, they fail Eliquis or Zeralto, doctors, well, I'll put you on, I'll put you on warfarin. There's a few situations that may make sense, but you really should make sure the patient took, the, took their drug correctly, took their Zeralto or Eliquis correctly, didn't miss doses, because in most cases, Zeralto and Eliquis are just as good as Coumadin or yeah. warfarin. So yeah, that's something to take up with your doctor. Take it up with your doc, but... And a lot of people asking questions are, are obviously on Xeralto. Someone also asked, are there any long-term side effects that you know of uh, with Xeralto? And like I said, I've been on it for almost 12 years. I've never had a side effect on it. That doesn't mean the next person's not going to have a side effect. Long-term side effect is going to be bleeding. That's the only one. That's what we know. And not, not any more bleeding than for short term. The bleeding risk for Xeralto is very low. It's about 0.4% it's about, uh, over years, which is very low. You know, uh, four out of a thousand people have a major bleeding event on Xeralto. There's a few other things that come up sometimes. They're rare. I have one patient out of hundreds and hundreds on Xeralto, thousands on Xeralto. It gets nausea sometimes on higher doses, better off on lower doses, gets nausea. It's pretty rare. The drug Dibigatran, that's a, that's a drug that um, is, is another DOAC, like similar to Eliquis or Xeralto. We don't use as much because it tends to cause more GI side effects long-term. Mm -hmm. A few people, rare, rare people reported hair loss after Xeralto or Eliquis. It's rare, 
and uh, doesn't seem to cause severe hair loss. Some people have noticed it, but it's, it's rare. Caleb, I saw Caleb laughing there. I don't know. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's not um, what caused mine. <laughs> <laughs> so pre it's pretty rare. I think the main thing you watch out for is bruising, bleeding, cutting yourself. I tell people you cut yourself. It's going to, it's going to go just, just, you know, put compression. It's going to bleed longer, but it will stop unless it's a big cut. You know, you don't want to be cutting arteries and things, but you know, right. little right. cuts will heal, will, will, will stop. They just take a little longer. Okay, uh, shift gears, another question. How does one deal with the chronic leg pain that comes with a chronic calcified DVT? So I think you should see someone that specializes, not a PCP, not a family doc, not an intern, someone that specializes in DVT. We've had a number of cases now, there's a device called the clot treever, and we've had patients with chronic DVT get, get this treatment with clot treever, clot extracted. And this is just over the last couple of years we've learned this. I've got a colleague in Michigan that's had patients with swollen legs, chronic clot, venous ulcers that are healing now um, after having this procedure done. So that's something to consider to talk to your doctor. They may not have heard of this clot treever device. Um, generally speaking, other clot busting agents that we sometimes use for big clots, things like TPA, if you've heard of that. If you had a big clot, you might've got TPA. They can cause bleeding, but they don't help with chronic clots that are long-term in the lung or the legs. So clot extraction may help. Your doctor's got to look at you, talk to you, help you make that decision. But that's something I would recommend. In terms of pain medicine, sometimes non-steroidal agents, we have to be a little careful with things like Motrin, ibuprofen, you take those along with the blood thinner, you're a little more susceptible to ulcers and a little more susceptible to bleeding. So you gotta be cautious there. Um, we really don't like people uh, being on chronic narcotics for leg pain, but this post-thrombotic syndrome, Todd, can be painful. So gotta see your doc. Compression stockings may help, but this is a very common problem. So we're working on solutions to get clot out, chronic clot out that may help with post-thrombotic syndrome. So I think yeah. we're gonna be learning more in the next few years. Okay, somebody was asking about how, how, when you're talking to your hematologist, you're talking to your doctor, and if they're just, if they just seem like they're nonchalant about everything, and, and they're not really addressing your concerns, is there a different way you can approach them? Should you just get another doctor? I mean, what, what would you do? What would you recommend to a, a patient that just doesn't have a doctor that wants to listen to them? Yeah, naturally, you got to individualize that. We talked to Chris Bosch the other night. Chris talked to a group of us about his blood clot experience. And one thing he mentioned that bothered me, he said, you know, I'll tell you guys, when I, when I talked to my doctor, he didn't seem empathetic. He just seemed like he, you know, he was a nice guy. I'm a famous guy. He was taking care of me, but he didn't seem like he really cared that much. If your doctor doesn't have empathy, I'm not saying they've got to give you their cell phone number. I do that, but many doctors don't. Um, but uh, but if somebody should be listening to you and listening to your complaints, your problems, and answering the questions the best, best they can. If they can't answer, they say, I, I don't know the answer to that. And some docs will refer you. They'll say, you know what? I've been doing this for a while, but I've got a friend, you know, my, my friend Sam Berkman at Cedars. He's been doing this for 40 years. Maybe you should see him and talk to him, for example. Talk to another doctor. So I think if you're not happy, you got to see another doctor. I, I just, you, you can do it gently. You can do it nicely or not. But, but your health is important. If you're not getting your answers, maybe you have some questions there aren't answers to, but someone's yeah. got to be trying to answer those questions for you. So yeah. try to, it's a tough one, but get a, get a new doctor, darn it, if you're not happy. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what, when, when I got that PE after the colonoscopy, he got an earful and he was no longer my doctor, that I can Good. assure you. Uh, I want to ask you a question that came in actually to the support group that we have. Um, this came in last night and I, or actually this came in through an email inquiry and I, and he, uh, he's uh, registered in, so he's here. I promised that I would read this question out. So, um, and I'm going to quote from, from how he put this. I am a distance runner and had a PE two years ago. My recovery has been very up and down. I have runs that I can breathe somewhat normal and others that I am suffocating the entire way. Trying to get to the bottom of this has been impossible because it's not consistent. And he's wondering, is, is eating certain things causing some inflammation? Is there inflammation going on that can maybe be contributing to his problem? Should he watch his diet? So inflammation and clotting are very closely linked. Obesity is a state of inflammation. People don't realize that sometimes, but there's not any good, really strong data that diet, except for keeping your weight at a reasonable place, makes a big difference. So we can't answer that question for sure. But if, the, if there are ups and downs, it's unusual for people with chronic blood clots in the lung to have very waxing and waning symptoms. It can happen some, but if you're having a great day, you can run 15 miles. Another day, you can only run five miles. That's probably not a blood clot. I would say if you're, if you're having symptoms still, it's really important to do this. You need another scan to make sure we know if there's clot there. If there's no clot there, then... There's two kinds of scans, a CT scan and a VQ scan. The CT scan is a good scan for new, fresh blood clots. 
when your clots are older, many doctors are not great at reading those CT scans. The VQ scan is a test. You do it if it's normal, there aren't clots there. CT scan, if it's normal, there might be clots there because clots that are chronic and old look a lot different and some doctors can't read them. We've had a couple CT scans miss chronic clots at Cedars. So I would just say a VQ scan, a ventilation perfusion scan, VQ scan, if you're having symptoms, if that's normal, it's not blood clots. If, it is nor if, if, if it's normal, it's not blood clots. If it's abnormal, then you need someone to consider a CT scan, do some more testing and, work, and evaluate you. But this, this, this distance runner, you know, he still may have some clots present and there still could be something to be done. If you've got chronic clots, there's a surgical procedure. There's something called balloon angioplasty. There's several things that can be done, but someone's got to evaluate you, measure the pressures in your lung with something called an echo. You probably had it done, you had a PE, put that probe on your chest, measure the pressures, determine if you have pulmonary hypertension. If you have high blood pressure in your lungs, pulmonary hypertension from blood clots, that's treatable with other, with other modes. So I'm uh, sorry for the long answer, Todd, but okay. you got to get scanned. Our, our, our runner friends got to make sure there's no clot there. If there's no clot there, he needs a good pulmonologist or cardiologist to help him figure out why he's short of breath. But back to the original question, it's great to have, I think there's diets that are helpful. Any low, low inflammation diets are probably good. We don't have as much proof. They help with clots, but weight loss, keeping your weight and ideal body weight is, is, is really important. Okay, somebody just asked, can they take a multivitamin with vitamin K in it? Um, you can take, if you're on Coumadin, you don't want high doses of vitamin K. Most, most multivitamins don't have a lot of vitamin K in them. So the, the issue with vitamin K is, you know, if you're on a blood thinner called Coumadin, that's a vitamin K antagonist. If you give someone too much vitamin K, then their Coumadin may not work so well. That's why we tell people to have steady diets, eat a little salad, greens, but don't eat a, a lot on one day and a little on another, or your Coumadin level may go up and down. So a vitamin K is usually not a necessary vitamin to take. It's not in most multivitamins. vitamins. A little bit is fine though. Okay. And it doesn't and, affect uh, Eliquis or Xarelto at all. Awesome. Okay. And you know what, we, we've still got just about everybody still uh, listening. So if you don't mind, we're probably going to run just a few minutes over. I've uh, got more questions I want to get want to get answered if you don't mind. Um, let me just read you one that uh, came in through the email. Uh, I'm a week out of the hospital now on my fifth PE, number five. Um, I've got a genetic antithrombin three deficiency. All my clots, I knew the trigger, but this one I don't. I have been treated recently for hep C after diagnosed with cirrhosis and curious about the link between the liver and blood clots. This is a tricky one. Antithrombin deficiency, we used to call it antithrombin three, called antithrombin deficiency now, can, can, can cause increased blood clotting. There's several types of antithrombin deficiency. Generally speaking, if someone's had five blood clots, I can promise you they were off anticoagulation for part of that time. It's really unusual to be on anticoagulation full dose and have recurrences over again. Some situations like cancer, we see recurrences. Someone comes with recurrence, could be due to cancer or something else. It's unusual. So got to stay on the blood there. Now, when you got cirrhosis, you have a risk of bleeding that's higher. Now you can have cirrhosis and your, your blood clotting system, some of these clotting factors are made in the liver, the process in the liver. And um, so you can have cirrhosis and have abnormal high blood clot levels or high clotting factor levels or low clotting factor levels. That's gotta be sorted out carefully by your doctor, but there's a tendency for many people with cirrhosis to bleed, which is really a balance when you have blood clot. When you have blood clots, you've gotta, you've gotta see a liver specialist and a clotting specialist and, and, and not, not give me a question we can answer without looking at your chart in detail on this call. But uh, remember cirrhosis can cause bleeding. It can also lead to clotting and any trauma deficiency and other uh, deficiencies can occur in, in liver disease. There's, there is a link between the liver and clotting. Sometimes that big blood vessel that goes in the liver, the portal vein can clot off in liver disease. So it's tricky, but that's, that's the kind of person that needs a, a careful evaluation, should have not just a, a, a family doctor, but a hepatologist, liver disease doc following along closely. Okay, uh, we had this question come in and you know what, I want you to educate me on this as well because there's a little bit of confusion. Um, aspirin is not an anticoagulant, but how does aspirin help with blood clot prevention? Does it? It does. Aspirin is an antiplatelet agent, and platelets are these little little things in your bloodstream that, that help. They, they probably start the clotting the clotting system a, a lot of times. That they're not platelets aren't that important in what we call venous clots. They're really important in stroke and in heart attack. Not as important. So aspirin is an antiplatelet agent. There's two studies that show the Warfosa study and the Aspire study. These two clinical trials both showed aspirin is better than nothing at preventing blood clots, DVTP, but not as good as a blood thinner. So you got an active guy like Caleb, he's on aspirin, 
Now his doc has seen him, so he knows he knows that maybe that's okay for him. He's a very active guy. I would say in general, we know the risk of getting a blood clot, for example, on aspirin is three times higher than if you're on the low dose of Xeralto. And the risk of bleeding was the same. Risk of bleeding for aspirin and Xeralto, about 0.3.4%. So Xeralto is better than aspirin, but aspirin does something. It, 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 is an, it, it is an antiplatelet agent and can help prevent clots. So, you know, for example, I was thinking about when Caleb was talking, Caleb's doc, I hope thought about this carefully, knows that Caleb's an active guy, probably stays hydrated, maybe aspirin's okay, but um, that's gotta be discussed. So if I was Caleb's doc, I'd say, you know, you know, would you think I should be on Tenazeralto? If the bleed, the major bleed risk is the same, should I be on that? Or, you know, I'm an athlete, I'm banging myself around and stuff, maybe aspirin is the safer drug. And that's probably why, you know, it may be that the major bleed rate's the same for aspirin and Xeralto. But for you, Caleb, it might be that because you're so active and you're so physical, maybe the risk of bleeding could be higher on Tenazeralto. So I'm sure your doc has thought that through. Anyway, bottom line, aspirin is better than nothing. But if we can be on Xeralto or Eliquis, we'd prefer to do that if we can. And some situations, aspirin's okay. The doc's got to think that over carefully. Okay. Uh, another question I see coming into the support group a lot is how does high altitude affect the risk for blood clots? Um, athletes often run and bike at a high altitude, skiing, doing all this other stuff. How does high altitudes come into play here? Sure. So it may be, and there's a couple of things with high altitude. One is there's something we see called hypoxic vasoconstriction. It can make blood vessels uh, narrow down and that, that might increase the risk of clotting some. Um, if you're on a vacation and you're not skiing, but you're at 8,000 feet or 10,000 feet, it may be, some people have said just moving less because you're less active. You're not running, you're not running, you're not walking as fast, you're doing less, you're sitting more, um, you, may be, you may be at higher risk. Um, so whether, whether high, uh, high altitude really causes coagulation to occur more or whether it's these other secondary factors, a little harder to sort out, but, um, but certainly when you're at altitude, people get colder, they don't move as much, they sit in their chair and watch TV longer when they're on vacations unless they're skiers. So yes, I think movement and hydration are critical for high altitude. Okay, um, so we're not done yet. We're, we're gonna be done here real shortly, everybody, but I see that everybody's still here. So everybody still wants answers and we still have some questions. And I wanna give JT and Caleb an opportunity to say anything else that they wanna say. There is a couple of things I need to run. Uh, I just wanna run by everybody. Um, first of all, I wanna thank all the patients and encourage them to like our Facebook page at Stop the Clot. Uh, go to stoptheclot.org and go to the uh, Facebook page and please follow us like the page. You're going to learn a lot of information there. Don't forget to follow us on Instagram, um, Twitter, um, and register for future pep talks under the peer support page on our website at stoptheclot.org. Julia is going to send that link in the chat. She's going to do that now. She's also going to send a couple of other things. For those of you that don't know, we do have a Facebook support group under the NBCA banner now, uh, Team Stop the Clot own Facebook group, and it is exploding. We're uh, getting close to 3,000 members already since January. Great place to hang out. Uh, Julie is going to put that in the uh, chat box as well, so please join. I'll approve you uh, in the group as soon as we get out of this pep talk. Um, follow Team Stop the Clot and let them uh, know that we have a few spots left for the New York City Marathon. Julia is going to post a link for the New York City Marathon. We always have the polka dots running in that thing. We want as many people to join up on that team as possible. So look for the link at the in the chat. Um, we just want you to know that we, we do more than just sit around and talk about blood clots to patients. We are big patient advocates at, in Washington, D.C. as well. If you uh, hadn't heard, Senator Grassley and Senator Lujan from New Mexico, uh, Grassley from here in my state, they all supported the blood clot resolution and introduced it into Congress. And uh, it was a unanimously accepted deal. And that is really huge. And we've got more political news coming up as well. But we're very involved with advocacy in a number of different ways. And um, let's see, I also want to thank all the women who have joined uh, the program tonight. Again, I, I see, you know, 60, 70 people still on board here. A lot of them are women. We're so glad that you came in because knowledge is power. There's plenty of you to learn too. This was just an opportunity for the guys to get together and learn a little bit about that recurrence thing and just kind of talk uh, about man things. But we're so glad that you and your spouse, your boyfriend, your family have shown up for this. Um, I think it was really successful. Um, 
JT, do you have, before, what I'm going to do to close out this pep talk is I'm going to fire off like nine or 10 really quick questions to Vic so we can give a quick answer. So we have more answers for what we've had coming in. But do you got anything to add uh, before we head out of here? Just three quick things. This is from, from my own experience here is yeah. after, you, after your blood clot, there are going to be hard days. There's no doubt about it. So get used to it. I went back to the hospital three times thinking I had recurrence. I didn't. So it's going to be hard, but you can get through it. Look at Caleb and myself and Todd as examples. Factor five Leiden me recognizing or learning that I had it, I am actually looking at it as a blessing. Having a wife, four daughters, two sisters with children, they all could get tested. We could actually be in more of a preventative mode for, for them in the future. So that was a blessing for me. Um, and then in terms of trusting your doctor and being your own advocate, I fired my hematologist immediately the first time I saw him um, and found somebody that, I could, that could help me uh, and was gonna get me answers. So please be your own advocate. You know, please, you you do deserve answers. So go out and get them, please, and use the use the Facebook pages that the NBCA is providing here as your uh, as your friend. Absolutely, great advice. Thank you, JT, and uh, thank you for 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 being with us tonight. And okay. hang on just a second because we've got some other things to talk about. So you're you're welcome to hang on, Caleb Benson. I just want to thank yeah. you for the second time showing up and being a part of something that we've done live. Uh, we have followed you. Uh, we're big fans of yours. We, we think that you are, are a great thrombassador uh, for other people. <laughs> so I just wanted to say thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and I, I think big thing out there, everybody, just remember you're not alone. Um, and just like JT brought back up, um, you're going to have days where you're not sure. Um, and th this is not a time to like risk it, um, it to play it safe. Uh, I went back in, I had, I actually got pleurisy again, not too long ago. And, you know, you know, I was like, I've got kids, I've got family. It's not as bad, but I'm going to go get it checked out. Um, and um, that was the biggest thing for me is to be like, Hey, you don't got to be tough um, no. because it's not worth your life. Um, no. And on the backside of that, my final reminder to keep telling everybody, you know, um, motivation comes out of discipline, set small goals, work with your doctor and uh, your life will get better. Yeah, look, when it comes to, to being tough, I am not an example, right? I'm 6'2", 230, and I weep like an infant. So I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a, an emotional roller coaster kind of guy. Caleb, we love you, man. Uh, th thanks for being here tonight. Thanks, guys. And Dr. Victor Tapson, we're going we're gonna to close out with you and ask some rapid fire questions. Um, but we love you too, Vic. Uh, I, I got to tell you, we, we, we are so glad that you were able to be here. And I think, you know, we can't get to everybody's questions, but I want them to send them into uh, the National Blood Clot Alliance so we can try to get those uh, things addressed. But but we've got some some pretty important questions to touch on real quick. And maybe you could just give like the, the minute or less answer and then we'll close out. Sure. Um, brain fog. Is brain fog and all that mental exhaustion and and uh, confusion and memory loss we're feeling is that coming from the blood thinner man or is is that coming from the trauma or what? Pretty unusual coming from blood thinner and it's pretty unusual to come from a clot. I mean, there are occasional patients who get clots that get, go to their lungs and and, and it may escape through a hole in their heart and go to the brain and cause but that causes stroke, not brain fog. We know COVID has been closely linked with clots. We saw so many people in the COVID, especially with Delta, um, get get not so much with Omicron now, but with Delta, get come in the hospital with COVID, get blood clots. So um, that COVID clearly causes brain fog. I think a lot of the brain fog we see can be stress and anxiety. It doesn't seem to be directly related to clot or directly related to the medication in most cases. But again, it's always good to talk to your doctor about that to make sure, Todd. And before I, you answer the next question, I want to say, I am so sorry to anybody who didn't get their question answered. Somebody of you may have been on here for an hour or longer and really wanted to get your question answered. But but Todd, we'll do this again and we'll answer every question we have because I, I think that people on that didn't get their things answered. So I apologize. Absolutely. Really and and, and Julie, Julia put that, that link up to the support group page. We have Facebook support group. If people go in there and become a member, ask the question in a post and we will get that answer. I, I will go to you. I will go to whoever I need to, right. to get that answered. So we're not going to leave them hanging. Right. Um, Natto. Okay. We, we, we're hearing a lot about this natural stuff. Natto can ease all, all this. Uh, they're selling it in supplement form. People are buying bottles by the box load and mm -hmm. thinking that that is going to take care of their blood clot issue. How do you feel about Natto? 
it won't take care of your blood clot issue. I, I think I'd be very careful about that. I mean, I think you got to be really, you got to be really careful of anything that's not FDA approved. I mean, I just, I know there's, I, I, I think it's wise for people to think about their diets. Nothing against, there's very few things in nature that are, that, that people take in supplements that are bad for you. Again, um, I'd be very cautious about St. John's wort. St. John's wort will chew up your Eliquis and your Xeralto. Don't take St. John's right, wort and Eliquis or Xeralto. There's a few medications you shouldn't take. Um, very few, um, very few drugs that are bad for you that interact with the, that are na natural drugs that are bad for you that'll interact with your blood clot medicine. Um, but I'd be very cautious of taking anything that's not FDA approved for proven blood clot. Yeah, good advice. Um, do I, you touched on this a little bit, but do I need to get another CT scan just to see if my clot has been absorbed and, and has gone now? We don't usually do it, Todd, unless someone has symptoms. Now, our friends in Europe tend to do it more often. We do know residual blood clots tend to increase the risk of recurrence. So if your doctor is going to stop your blood thinner, um, that's one situation to consider it, but we'll often scan the legs. Scanning the legs is probably the best, one of the best predictors. If they're going to stop your blood thinner and you still have abnormalities in your legs, chronic clot, what we call poor recanalization, the vessels aren't, aren't filling as well. That's a risk for recurrence and your blood thinner probably shouldn't be stopped in most cases if you have a poor recanalization or chronic clot in the legs. So repeating the scans for sure. If your legs are symptomatic, the ultrasound should be repeated. If your lungs are, if you're still in shortness of breath, repeat, repeat, repeat a scan and make sure there's not chronic clot there. Um, if you're feeling perfectly fine and you're out running 10 miles a day or you feel normal, most people think there's no big advantage to repeating the scan. Some people would say, if you're gonna stop the blood thinner, consider it. And that may make it, that may, but again, gotta to talk to your doctor about that. Sure, um, going back to Xeralto, what's the, what's the chance of somebody actually suffering a recurrence if they're taking Xeralto? Do you know anybody, any, any sure. stats on that at all? Uh, stats are very low. It's, it's less than 5%, somewhere between 1% and 2%. If, and if you have cancer, the risk is higher. If you don't have cancer, uh, the risk of a recurrence on, on full dose Xeralto, you're taking it with food, or very low. The risk, if you've been on the, on, on the Xeralto more than six months and your drop, doctor drops your dose to half dose Xeralto, same is true with Eliquis. They drop you from five twice a day to two and a half twice a day. That's the low dose. The risk of recurrence is exceedingly low. But like Todd alluded to earlier, he's homozygous factor five Leiden. In that situation, we don't have a lot of information. With cancer, you might recur. Other situations, recurrence rates are very, very low if you don't miss doses of drug. Okay, um, I know a lot of people are going to be mad at me back at NBCA, but I got a couple more questions for you. Okay, I'm going to make them stay up. Uh, sure. Can the doctor discuss the comment earlier about uh, genome therapy? Um, I have factor uh, factor two uh, prothrombin uh, blood disorder, and would love yeah. to hear if there will be an alternative solution to lifelong blood thinners. Do you have any comment? Great question. So, factor five Leiden, one in twenty Caucasians, one in twenty people have the heter or heterozygous for factor five Leiden. Much less common to be homozygous. So, one in twenty. It's a very common thing, and most people don't get blood clots. Prothrombin gene mutation. About one in a hundred Caucasians um, are heterozygous for prothrombin gene mutation. In other non-Caucasian races, they're less common. We know about. We know about probably half of the thrombophilias, as we call them, that, that are known, the gene abnormalities. We don't know them all. That's why some of you are unprovoked, get tested, and we don't find anything. It's not because you don't have anything. We're not, we, don't, we don't know what it is to test for it yet. We're learning more all the time about that. To answer the question, eventually, we might have gene therapy for some of these diseases. For some of these, if it's a point mutation on a gene, some of these, some of, there may be an infusion you might get in five or 10 years. So I always tell you know, if someone's 97 years old, I, I might tell them they're going to be on lifetime therapy. But if someone's young, I like them to know there's so much research in this area. It's possible you might come off a of blood thinner someday and be on some easier therapy. But right now, I think Xeralto and Elkos are doing a, they're doing a pretty good job. We don't have to monitor blood levels anymore. There's very few drug interactions. So um, we're hoping for that day to come, Todd. Okay. Is, is, there, is there a difference between the initial mm -hmm. sharp pain you feel from when that blood clot first mm -hmm. forms and the scarring and the lung infarct that you feel afterwards, is there a difference in that pain? There is, yeah. The, the pain that, that, that Caleb and JT felt early in their blood clots, I, I, I thank God for that pain because there's a lot of people like Caleb and JT wouldn't have gone to the doctor. It's, it's painful for three or four days, different, different people. Usually doesn't last beyond a week. Usually a couple of days, get a blood gets better. And these pulmonary infarctions, you know, a myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack. That kills, that kills heart tissue. A pulmonary infarction is 
usually can, can cause a little scarring, but doesn't usually cause any permanent lung damage. But some people do notice chronic pain in those areas. And one thing you got to be careful about, if you get new pain, new pain, we take a deep breath. You just got to make sure if it's brand new out of the blue, that that's not a new blood clot. Sometimes you might present your first blood clot might be pain in your leg and swelling. And, and if you have a recurrence, it might be shortness of breath or pain in your chest. So patients need to understand the presentation might be different the next time you come in. Okay, any final words of wisdom or advice for all the people listening? Well, just, just I, I really appreciate JT and Caleb coming along and tell their stories. Uh, you, got, you gotta be tough, don't be too tough. Talk to your doctor, get a good doctor. If they're not listening, get someone that'll listen. And, and I, I'm really thankful we have these new drugs out and that we can, we can take care of this disease. Um, stay hydrated if you're, if you're, you know, make sure you get up and move around when you're on the plane. Um, and uh, um, please, please come to the next support group with questions or thoughts or comments. We can learn from all of you and your experiences. And uh, I just thank you for all listening. And I think we need to do a better job get, creating awareness for, for patients and doctors. We still see this disease missed when someone comes in the ED. It's frustrating. So um, we want to we want everyone to learn as much as they can. You guys can teach people out there too. Let's raise awareness for this disease so that, it, so that we can uh, uh, make more progress, make more diagnoses and, uh, and treat it better. You know, I got to tell you, we're reaching a lot of people and I know we're saving a lot of lives yeah. and, and I think we're doing an excellent job of, of getting the education out there. And that support system is just really, is really big time. And, and that's the very last thing I want to say, Todd, thank God for you guys, NCBAU and Leslie Lake and your whole team. Um, awesome job you guys are doing this. This patient oriented organization just helps so many people. So please keep up the good work. Okay, well, before I say goodbye, I just want to say uh, some of my colleagues are going, mention the marathon again. So I'm mentioning the marathon again. I need you guys to, to if you want to get, I know we've got distance runners in the group. I know you from the blood clot support group. Please don't try to hide. I know you're there. I see your names. Uh, sign up, get a bib, wear the polka dots, represent the National Blood Clot Alliance at the New York City Marathon. Go to stoptheclot.org. You'll find out all the information. Follow Team Stop the Clot. Come to the support group and let's just all be uh, one big happy family, like I like I told you all before. Thanks again to JT Lasker. Thanks to Caleb Benson. Thank you very much, Dr. Victor Tapson. We're going to do one of these again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, Todd. Great job. Thank you. Good guys. night. Good Take night, care, everybody.